Alleluia. Hallelujah. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I've never been as excited to come to church as I was this morning. So excited was I to come to church that I woke up at 5 a.m. to come to church. Yeah, my wife couldn't understand. I was dressed by 7.30. And I was sitting there waiting. When are we getting to church? I was anticipating so much. So I, I was thinking about it. I was like, I've never been this excited to go to church. To this extent where I love my sleep, but you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh. You know, normally my sermons come the night before. This one came on uh, Wednesday night. Huh? Thursday morning, literally. 2 a.m. It was 2.57 a.m. on Thursday morning. I woke up and the sermon was there. So I ran quickly and began to write. Except that now I've left what I've written in the bag. <laughs> Hallelujah. But, yeah. But the Lord gave me a word. I have never been this excited to preach a message because I was preaching to myself as I was writing it. The only thing is it's yeah, many pages, so hallelujah, we shall do what we can and we'll leave the rest for the next time. Hallelujah. Mm. I'm excited about this message because I feel that it's going to announce a change of season. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, so, this morning, I want to share the title of this message is, When You Pray. When You Pray. Hallelujah. Open Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, we are starting right from verse 1. It says, then he was praying in a certain place. And when he stopped, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John told his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray. In my Bible, there is a comma there. And he said to them, when you pray. He didn't say to them, if you pray. He said to them, when you pray. So it's not optional. Hallelujah. Prayer is not optional. He said, when you pray. So he expected them to pray. Hallelujah. Isaiah 56, 7. Keep your finger there on Luke 11. We are going to come back there. But now, Isaiah 56, 7. He says, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. And this is old KJV, so if things sound a bit strange. For mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. Matthew 21, 13. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Mark eleven seventeen. And he told, saying unto them, is it not written, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Luke 1947, 1946 says, saying unto them, it is written, my house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Now, why am I reading this so much? Because we need to understand something. 
There is a scriptural principle that says repetition is establishment. Joseph told Pharaoh, the reason that the dream was repeated unto you twice is because it has been established and it will shortly come to pass. So repetition meant that this was something that God has established. Whenever God repeats something over and over again, he's, it's something that is established and he wants you to pay attention. The same way when he says, verily, verily, you know there is something serious coming at that point. The same reason why everywhere you go in the Bible, the just shall live by faith, the just shall live by faith in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's an established thing. So now he repeats over and over again from the Old Testament to the New Testament, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But when he says my house, he doesn't mean this building here. Because you see, Tomorrow we might break it down and build something bigger. But when he says, my house, Acts 17, 24, it says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Hallelujah. Our God does not dwell in what? In temples made with hands. So where does he dwell? First Corinthians 3.16 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwelleth in you? And I'm being very fast. Second Corinthians 6.16 And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So we are the temple. Hallelujah. When he says my house shall be a house of prayer, he's saying you shall be a house of prayer. Hallelujah. You, 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 the temple, you, the house. Peter referred to himself as a house. He said, and soon I shall be laying down this house. So you are a house. This container here, it's a house. It's housing you. And these days it houses you and the Holy Spirit. So this house here, it shall be a house of prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The question is, is your house a house of prayer? Or is it a house of reverie? Is it a house of prayer? Can you look around and say, this is a house of prayer? Is it a house of prayer? How much are you praying? You see, for me to call a certain place, if we say that is a house of dance, it means that the primary function in that house is dancing. If we say that's a house of worship, it means the primary thing that occurs in that house is worship. So when we say you're a house of prayer, is the primary thing that happens in, this, in that house, when we look at it, is the primary function of that house prayer? Is it prayer? We are meant to live a life of prayer. Hallelujah. 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 Do you know that there is prayer in heaven? You know, I used to think there is no prayer in heaven because God is right there. So, you know, why should you be praying? But let's read John fourteen sixteen. He says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Now, remember Jesus was talking about a time when he has already gone. So he's in heaven, but he's praying to the Father. That the Father may send us a comforter, another comforter. Hallelujah. Revelation 5.8. It says, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. 
having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So the prayers of the saints are in heaven. So there are prayers in heaven. Revelation 8.4. It says, And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So there is prayer. Right there in the presence of God, there are prayers. And the Bible also tells us that Jesus ever lives to intercede. What is intercession? Prayer. So Jesus is constantly in prayer. Now, if Jesus is constantly in prayer, what about you? If Jesus, even after ascending up there, is constantly in prayer, interceding for you, what about you? Hallelujah. Let's go back to Luke 11. I hope you kept a finger there in your Bible. So we're back, verse 2. And he said to them, when you pray, comma, say. Ah, you see? Even this version that we are looking at here. It's, when you pray, comma, so there is a pause. Say. Now when I grow up in the Anglican church, they had taught us that you could keep quiet. You could pray silently. That, you know, they would say, let us pray, and then everyone keeps quiet. And there's this whole moment of silence that we are busy praying in our hearts. It says, when you pray, say. Not when you pray, think. It didn't say when you pray, meditate. It said, when you pray, say. So when you pray, open your mouth and say something. And you see saying, saying is not, no, you open your mouth. It is clear. You say, you see, when I, when I come, if I were to walk up to Pastor God, you say, speak up. Because I mean, it, it doesn't help for me to go and start mumbling. What, what is he saying? When you pray, say. Psalm 28, 2. Psalm 28, 2. He says, hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee. When I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. What I say? Hear the voice of my supplications. He must hear an actual voice. So when you keep quiet and they say, let us pray and you keep quiet. There is no voice for him to hear. He says, hear the voice. There's a spiritual recorder somewhere. When you open your voice, there's a recorder. Then it goes there. Then they raise incense there in front of the throne. And the voice actually comes out in your voice. In heaven. He says, hear the voice. Hallelujah. Acts 4.24. He says, and when they had that, they lift up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. I say, they lifted up their voice. They didn't quietly meditate. They didn't silently. They, they lifted up. And lifting up means there was some volume involved. There is a preacher we, 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 whose music we sometimes listen to, and at some point he says, lift it up, choir. What does he mean? He's telling the choir, increase the volume. So he said, they lifted up their voice with one accord. They lifted up. Someone used to ask me, but I don't understand you born again Christians. The cacophony that happens. You say, let's pray, and then everyone begins to, make, to speak loudly. At the same time, what's that cacophony? Why doesn't someone, you know, pray and everyone else agrees and says, yes, Lord, at the right times? He says, they lifted up their voice with one accord. Doesn't mean they were saying the same things. They were just in one accord. 
towards the same purpose, towards this, but in different words, they lifted up their voice. Hallelujah. Mm. So when they say, let's pray, we lift up our voices. We don't speak silently. We lift our voices. Because you know what? You know, we, we, we sometimes get in church and you're worried about your neighbor hearing the things you're praying. We are so mindful of what other people think. And yet, you know what's interesting? They are so caught up also in their own things, they have no time to listen to your prayer. They too have things to pray for. So you spend time restricting yourself, barely able to pray because you're worried about what they'll hear, what your needs are, and whatever it is you're struggling with. They are too busy lifting up their own things to God. And so what if they hear? Anyway, you're not praying to them. It says, lift, they lifted up their voice. They didn't speak softly. Second Chronicles 30, 27. It says, then the priests, the Levites, arose and blessed the people. And their voice was heard. It says, their voice was heard. And their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, even unto heaven. Their voice was heard. It was not their intention. They didn't say their intention was heard. Or they, it says their voice, their actual voice. These vocal cords here, their voice was heard. Is your voice being heard? Is your voice actually being heard when you pray? Or are you so busy worried about what people are going to hear, what are they going to think, what, you know, if I raise up my voice, that there is no voice being heard. Let your voice be heard. Psalms 5, verse 3. It says, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and we look up. Your voice, again, he says what? My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. Psalm 66, 19. He says, But verily God hath had me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. So, there is the prayer, but he attends to what? To the voice of the prayer. Lift up your voice when it's time to pray. Hallelujah. Psalm 142 verse 1. It says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. Not with someone else's voice. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. Hallelujah. You know, some of us, we are very busy asking the whole world to pray for us. What about your voice? God wants to hear your voice. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. Hallelujah. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. Twice in the same verse, he's talking about his voice. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. You know, sometimes we have this mentality because some people have so many testimonies. We think that somehow God hears their voice more than he hears other people's voices. So we are always, you know, we want to go to the other one and the other one because, you know, we've had their testimonies. God hears your voice. And he says, with my voice did I make my supplication. Lamentation 356. Thou hast heard my voice. Hide not thine ear at my breathing, at my cry. Again, my voice and my cry. There's some serious crying here involved. And God hears. Hallelujah. So he says, lift up. Lift up. 
Hallelujah. Hey, we are going to raise some noise. You know, before we finish here, we are going to pray. And we are going to pray, real prayer. We are going to lift up our voices. Hallelujah. Yes, we are in Holy Ghost class. So after class, we do practicals. Hallelujah. Let's go back to Luke 11. He says, when you pray, say, we're still on verse 2. What's the first thing he says? Our Father who is in heaven. Our Father who is in heaven. There's a fundamental realignment of doctrine in just that little phrase. Before that, people were not praying our Father. Suddenly, Jesus brought a new concept of God as a father. Before he was El Shaddai, Elohim, El, all these Els. But suddenly now, it was very simple. He just became Abba, Father. Oh, I love the names of God. I love the different manifestations of who he is. But this one, this is different. He's now saying, our Father, who is in heaven. There is a completely different, there is a change of relationship here. It has ceased to be about some distant guy. He's now a father. But there is something here. First of all, Romans 8.15. Romans 8.15. But as I say, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You've been adopted. You know one of the amazing things that you, when, if you want to see adoption in action, when they name the tribes of Israel, they name Manasseh and Ephraim. But Manasseh and Ephraim were the children of Joseph. But when Jacob was about to die, Joseph brings his sons to him to bless them. And then Jacob tells Joseph that these ones are now my children. The others you will have will be yours, but these two are now mine. He adopted them. Suddenly, they became of the children. So now you hear, now suddenly, they even got their own inheritance. Where before it was all the other tribes, suddenly for Joseph, he got double for his trouble. Because since he had two, Manasseh and Ephraim, they got double, he got a double portion. Instead of saying the tribe of Joseph, it was the tribe of Manasseh and the tribe of Ephraim. Galatians 4, 6. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Matthew 18, 19. Now before we read Matthew 18, 19, I want us to note something interesting here. What does he say? When you pray, say, Our Father who is in heaven. Another important thing to note about that powerful phrase is this. All prayer is meant to be directed to the Father. You know, for a long time, you know, I, I went to school with a lot of Catholics and they would sometimes pray to all, all manner of saints. And they had this very nice logical argument. It sounded very logical. They would say, you know, um, when you want something from your dad, don't you sometimes go to your mom and you ask her to talk to him? So in the same way, we too, we go and talk to, you know, uh, Mary and we ask her to intercede on our behalf. And the same thing with the saints. I say, Jesus, when he teaches, because I said, teach us how to pray. 
And he tells them, when you pray, say, our Father. So he directs them that every prayer they should make is to the Father. Now let me say something that some people may find controversial. Jesus never told anyone to pray to him. Jesus never told anyone to pray to him. He said, when you ask the Father in my name. He did not say, when you ask me in my name. He didn't say, ask me. He said, ask the Father in my name. But you know, many times we come to pray and we say, Lord Jesus, I ask you. Mm -mm. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus. He said, teach us how to pray. You pray to the Father. So Matthew 18, 19. He says, again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father who is in heaven. He doesn't say that he's the one who will do it. He says his father is the one who will do it. Jesus, now you say Jesus is our Lord. We wouldn't be who we are without Jesus. The Bible says in Acts, in Jesus we live, we move, and have all of our being. But Jesus made it very clear that the purpose that brought him was to take us to the Father. Say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. He didn't say, I am the destination. He said, I am the way. To where? To the Father. John fifteen sixteen. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Then what does he say there? That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. See, there is a thing about asking in someone's name. There have been some people who I send and I say, um, go talk to my friend. Tell him I sent you. So what happens is when that person goes and says, Noah told me I could come to you about this. My friend's going to respond differently from how he would have responded if his guy had just come and said, I had come to you about this. Because they have come claiming my relationship with them. Hallelujah. So when he says, ask in my name, he's saying, presume upon my relationship with the Father. So literally, when you go to one of my friends and you go and you say, Noah told me, this is what it means. He's, it's like I am the one asking. So when you go and ask in the name of Jesus, it is as good as Jesus making a request. It is as good as Jesus himself making that request. You know when you carry a passport, it states that the government of this country requests. So basically, you are going, you are asking for admittance into another country in the name of the government of the country where you come from. And here, you know, it's a republic, so it's not the president. But you know when you carry a British passport, you actually, they request in the name of Her Majesty the Queen. It says, Her Majesty the Queen. Which is also why the Queen doesn't carry a passport. Because she cannot carry a document that asks in her name when she's there, right there. But you see, so when you pray, You've come with this passport. And says, Jesus requests of you the Father. 
So for you come to the Father and you make your request in the name of Jesus. John 16, 23. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you. There comes that nice phrase. Verily, verily. In some versions they say truly, truly. In this one, in the new KJV, they say, Most assuredly, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask who? The Father. In my name, he will give it to you. Now, here is the most critical one. John 16, from verse 26 to 27. It says, at that day you shall ask in my name. And I do not say unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you because you've loved me and have believed that I came out from God. So Jesus makes it very clear. We will ask in his name. And he will not ask for us. He makes it, he says, I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. No. Why? Because you will have prayed the Father for yourself in his name. You will have already prayed. He's basically saying, look, I will not have to come and then be there. And then you say, then I say. No, you will come and you will say, because I have given you access. I am the way I have given you direct access over there. You have direct access to the Father. You ask the Father directly in Jesus' name. Old habits are hard to break. Sometimes I find myself slipping back, then I have to remind myself, no, I have to ask the Father in Jesus' name. And let's see how, you know, sometimes we get into habits they are the wrong habits, yet they were never in scripture. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, he says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So prayers are answered by the Father. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you. So you ask the Father and it is the Father who answers prayer. Colossians 1.3 He says, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Who do they give thanks? God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How? In prayer. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So it is who? The Father who blesses us in Christ. Hallelujah. Woo. 1 Corinthians 15.24 Hallelujah. It says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. Next verse. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. You see, the scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 is telling us that God comes and he puts everything under Christ. 
That includes you and me. Then Christ, when everything has finally become subject to Christ, because it's a process, the kingdom advances, then Christ will also subject himself to the Father. It is scripture. You see, in no place in scripture did Jesus claim equality with the Father. Or he claimed to be one with the Father, but he did not claim to be equal with the Father. There is a difference. He is of the same substance like the Father. He's, he is made of the same godly substance that the Father is made of, whichever that is. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit. He's of the same spirit like the Father. But he is subject to the Father. That's so why he says, I do the will of my father. What he tells me, I do. And in, in 1 Corinthians 15, it explains that therefore him who puts everything under subjection is exempt himself because he's the one who puts everything else under subjection to the son. Hallelujah. So as you ask the father, you have this unique thing. You can now come to the Father the same way the firstborn Jesus Christ does. That is the uniqueness of what Christ did. The ability to come to the Father the same way he does. Because he's now a firstborn among many. And that's why the Bible says we are seated in heavenly places with Christ. That when we pray, we are literally sitting in heaven. Our prayers are getting there, right there. Hallelujah. So we go back to our Luke 11. You know, I love it. They put commas. So I'm also following the commas. Our Father who is in heaven. Comma. They should have put a cellar there. So now the next one is, Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. I was reading up the definition of hallowed. It says, honored as holy, or greatly revered or respected. It says, when you pray, say, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. You know, over the years as we've studied you know, God and everything. There has come a tendency to take God's name very lightly. The Jews were so careful with God's name that there is a name of God they couldn't even write down. They only put initials. The one we now call Yahweh, Y-H-V-H. But actually, nobody really knows how it was pronounced. The name was so holy that they only represented it with certain letters. And only the high priest knew how it's actually pronounced. Up to today, nobody really knows. It is our, people have just supposed that perhaps it's pronounced Yahweh. Perhaps it's pronounced Jehovah. Some people got the, y, you know, the YHVH and made it Jehovah. Others say, mm, it's Yahweh. But no one really is sure how that name was pronounced. It was so holy they couldn't even write it down. That's how, how much they hallowed his name. And these days, we take God's name so simply that, you know, I actually know people who have given their kids names that are of God. You find someone and they've named their kid Adonai. And you're thinking, really? And yet, this name thing is so serious that God tells Moses, I revealed myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, but by my name, the Lord, or Adonai, 
they did not know me. That there is something very powerful about a revelation in the name of God. You don't just take it simple. It's not, it's not just to throw around just like that. It is special. You don't just go around, you know, naming your kid who tomorrow is going to be doing some strange things and then you've named him Nisi, then you've named him Sabaoth and all sorts of things. Because, it says, if my people who are called by my name, no, these things are not for joking around with. Being called by his name is a serious issue. It says, hallowed be thy name. Exodus 27, 20 verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Deuteronomy 5, 11. It's the same scripture. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Psalm 139.20 says, For they speak against the wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Are you his enemy? When you take his name in vain, you start moving yourself into a category you, shouldn't, you don't want to belong to, that of enemies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Prayer must exalt God. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. I'm reading verse 4. It says, And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Then verse 7, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces and all the other things that go on after that. Verse 8, O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of, fa of face, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we've sinned against thee. Verse 9, to the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. Constantly Daniel kept contrasting God's goodness against his be abasedness, so to speak. His entire prayer, this was a prayer of intercession. He kept contrasting himself with God. Hallowed be thy name. When you are praying, spend some time talking about his greatness. Spend some time talking about his mercies and his forgiveness. Spend some time talking about the fact that righteousness belongs to him. Spend some time talking about how great he really is. Hallelujah. Always extol his name. Hallowed be thy name. Back to Luke 11. Thy kingdom come. Hallelujah. Thy kingdom come. I used to ask myself, why are we told to pray for his kingdom to come? Isn't God able to make his kingdom to come without us praying? Why do we need to pray? But there is something interesting. God delegated all authority on earth to us. So things here happen with our permission. That's why God would say, and I looked for a man to stand in the gap, and I could not find any. Why was God looking for a man? He needed someone who will stand in the gap and say, oh Lord, arise. Then the Lord could arise and do something. Isaiah gets this vision of heaven and the Lord is saying who will go for us haven't you ever wondered the angel appears to Cornelius 
and tells him send for Peter. Why didn't the angel just pre preach the gospel to Cornelius? Why tell him to go send for Peter? Angels can't preach the gospel. It's for man to do. The angel could not come and tell him, this is how, confess, and this and this. No, he told him, send for Peter. Hallelujah. Thy kingdom come. And remember something. If a kingdom comes, it comes with its king. It doesn't come alone. The kingdom always comes with its king. Micah, chapter 4, verse 7 to 9. Hallelujah. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation, so the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on even forever. And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the doves of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? For pangs have seized you like a woman in labor. So again, he's pointing out something. He's saying, the kingdom will come. And he's saying, so right now, why are you crying? Is, there, is it because there's no king? When the kingdom comes, it comes with its king. So they will stop crying because the kingdom will have come and the king and the counselor will have come with the kingdom. Now let's look at the, what happens when the kingdom comes. Matthew 12, 28. He says, but if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. When the kingdom of God shows up, devils have to go. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes we'd go to preach and you're just, you've just begun preaching and then devils start making noise. Start, yeah, and you're thinking, oh God. Initially, when I just started preaching, I would get distracted. I start chasing devils instead of preaching. Then I learned to just ignore the devils. The devils have to go because the kingdom has come. The moment you come and you start preaching the kingdom, the devils have to start waiting. And then they have to go. So I would preach the word and at the end of the service, chase the devils, tell them pack up and go. Hallelujah. So when the kingdom comes, the devils have to flee. Mark 9.1. He says, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. So the kingdom comes with power. It's not a powerless kingdom. It comes with power. And, all, and it's true. There were many standing there and they didn't die until they saw the kingdom come with power. How do we know? Because Paul says, I did not come with enticing words, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. And he told them, stay in Jerusalem until what? Until you receive power. He says, for you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So the kingdom came with power. And they went around preaching the kingdom with power. Hallelujah. You are entitled to power. Whenever you pray, thy kingdom come, you are immediately serving notice to every devil, and you are immediately also saying, now, it's my time to walk into power. The kingdom is not powerless. It comes with power. Just like any kingdom, any earthly kingdom has an army. It has, it has a military that enforces its rules and regulations. The kingdom of God has a military that enforces its rules and regulations. When the kingdom comes, there is power behind it. And that is why it is wrong 
for us to try to use the tools of this world to enforce the rules of the kingdom. We are not called to legislate morality. We are not called to try and make people live good lives by making laws and regulations that make them live good lives. We are called to preach the kingdom with power. It changes them from the inside. You know, even if you legislated and you got this Bible and then you made all the laws of the land, you sit down Congress and the Senate and they, and they make all the laws according to what's in here. Not a single person will be added to the kingdom until you preach. Not even one. We are called to preach with power because the kingdom, its army, doesn't operate using the earthly army. You don't use the earthly army to enforce kingdom edicts. You preach the gospel. Hallelujah. The kingdom comes with healing. Luke 10, 9. He says, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So when the kingdom shows up, healing shows up with the kingdom. So every time you're calling, thy kingdom come, you're calling healing. It comes with the kingdom. It is part of the kingdom to be healed. So the moment you accepted Christ and you became part and parcel of the kingdom of God. Healing is just part and parcel of it. It's not a favor, it's not a privilege, it's just, it's part and parcel of being a subject of the kingdom of heaven. It's, you are entitled to it as a subject. Hallelujah. I'm excited, I'm excited. Mm. This kingdom is not just, it's not a f just a physical manifestation. It starts within. Well, that's why he said, you receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And we know that's the kingdom. Luke 17, 20 to 21. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here, lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Hallelujah. You know, some people expect when we say, Thy kingdom come, that there's going to be this whole physical thing. The kingdom is within you. The full manifestation will come when Jesus comes to reign here. And they say, and the new Jerusalem came and what. But that will be the final end thing. But right now, the kingdom advances. As it advances within people, as more and more people are added, the kingdom is extending. Hallelujah. When the kingdom comes, the devil is overthrown. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 to 11. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth, deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto death so we advance the coming of the kingdom as we preach why? the Bible says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. As we testify of Jesus, as we testify of what he did, we are advancing the kingdom. 
and we're overcoming him. And he gets overthrown. With every person that's added to the kingdom, the devil is being overthrown. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God rules over all other kingdoms. All other kingdoms are subject to the kingdom of God. Daniel 2, 4, 44. says, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Hallelujah. Psalm 103, verse 19. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Hallelujah. So the kingdom is indestructible, and it rules over all. And the kingdom is everlasting. Daniel 7, 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. It's an everlasting kingdom. Now, there are a lot of other things about the kingdom, but we shall leave those for another time. Let's go to the next part about this kingdom here. The kingdom spreads and advances incrementally but inexorably. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13 verse 24. He gives them a parable about the man who sowed good seed in his field. Hallelujah. And I want to read it properly so that we get it. We flow with it all the way. The man sowed seed and the enemy came and so put tears and then all these things. But the thing about seed is that one seed yields a lot more. You don't plant one maize grain, then you harvest one maize grain. You plant one maize grain, and you harvest an entire cob. The kingdom of God is like seed. It is sown, and it brings a huge harvest in it incrementally. Verse 31. It says, and he, another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the seed, least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. The kingdom increases. It starts as a seed within you, and it grows. It grows into a huge tree within you. It grows until birds are coming and sheltering. What are those birds? Until you are busy reaching out to many others and they are coming and sheltering in this same kingdom that started as a seed within you. Many times we, we expect people to suddenly, they get saved and instant. No. The kingdom of God involves growth. Gradual growth. Even Jesus, the Bible says of him that he grew in wisdom and stature. If Jesus grew in wisdom, so Jesus didn't, wasn't born and suddenly he was absolutely wise. He grew in wisdom. If Jesus grew in wisdom, what makes you think you just get all of it by some impartation? Come here in the name of Jesus, receive wisdom, and then you get all of it and when one go. You grow in wisdom. Hallelujah. 
we grow in understanding. We grow in knowledge. We grow in stature. And I don't mean physical growth. But we grow in stature, spiritual stature. That's why he says, and he gave apostles, prophets, that we may grow unto the measure of the stature of Christ. We grow. Hallelujah. Verse 33 of Matthew 13. It says, Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto living, which a, man, a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. So again, you see what happens. It starts small. It's like a mold. You know when your bread starts to mold, it does not, the whole thing doesn't become green all of a sudden. It starts with a small part and then it spreads through the whole loaf. This kingdom of ours is contagious. It's like flu. Flu starts with one person and then before long the whole household is sick. That's the kingdom. You may be the first one in your home to receive salvation, but you are contagious. Hallelujah. You are contagious. Ooh. Sakarabos celebratae. Oh, now here is my favorite. The kingdom permits violence. Matthew eleven twelve. Hallelujah. I love this one. Mm. Says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. I love this one. You know why I love this thing? For a long time, I used to think the kingdom is suffering. How can the kingdom be suffering? The kingdom of heaven suffering? Until I began to look into the English. In the old English, when, we were, when people were asking for permission, they would say, suffer me to have that. Suffer me to do this. That's why we still have the word sufferance. That he did the following on his sufferance. The kingdom of God permits violence. That's what it's saying. And the violent take it by force. I used to believe, I had this thing, we would have these meetings at church, Holy Ghost meetings, and there's this prophet coming, visiting, and what. And initially I used to have this thing, it doesn't matter where I sit in the church. If God has a word for me, they'll call me out. If it's my word, it's my word. I'll tell you the truth, I sat behind there and nothing happened. Thankfully, here we are small. You can sit wherever and everyone can still see you. In a church of 10,500, you know, the church sits 10,500. When you're at the very back, they can't see you. And I used to think, I can just come and sit wherever I am. But notice something. You think Jesus did not know that there was a woman with an issue of blood. But she had to struggle, push through the crowd, keep pushing. Just say, if I can just reach there and touch. Hallelujah. Think of Bartimaeus. The Bible tells us about Bartimaeus. You know the most interesting thing about Bartimaeus? He shouted and people told him, keep quiet. You're making noise. Keep quiet. Some of us, you know, you're irritating us. Keep quiet. He shouted even louder. The kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Jesus would never have gone to Zacchaeus' house if Zacchaeus hadn't climbed that tree. He had to climb that tree for Jesus to see him. But he may have shouted. And the Bible says Jesus was leaving Jericho. So he was on his way out. And Bartimaeus is shouting, Son of David, have mercy upon me. He says in a loud voice, and it also says, people told him to keep quiet. Funny part is when Jesus heard him and said, now bring him, people said, oh, you've gotten favor, he's calling you. Some of the very people who sometimes are telling you, you know what, your shouting is irritating. When you get your miracle, the very ones who want to come and now, you know, ask, how did you do it? I need to tap that anointing. It was in the shouting. The time when you were telling me I'm embarrassing you, that's how I was getting it. 
You know, let me tell you, there is a secret to this prophetic thing. It's violence. And I don't mean, you know, you go and you beat the prophet. <laughs> but I mean, let me tell you that an interesting thing. I've had people come to me. I've, I've given this example before. I've had people come to me and say, you have my word, and I didn't have their word. I surely did not have their word, but they insist. So they insist so much that I say, okay, let's pray, and we start praying, and we pray, and we go in tongues, and before long, the Lord gives me their word. But if they hadn't insisted, they wouldn't have it. Pastor Christina was telling a story of my friend Robert. My friend Robert taught me this thing about violence. He would come and say, mm -mm, you are a prophet, you have my word. So he went to Pastor Christina. She, he came to, to my house. She was staying over there. He came and told her, you have my word. And she says she did not have a word. God had not told her anything about Robert. And for him, he kept insisting, mm -mm, I'm sure you have a word for me from the Lord. So they sat down and they begin talking and right, and the whole time she's saying, oh God, this guy has insisted I have his word, Lord. What do I tell him? Lord, what do I tell him? In the midst of all of that, the Lord gave her the word for him. The Lord told her, ask him three questions. Those three questions she asked him were what he needed to make certain decisions about his life. But it was because he insisted. He insisted. When Pastor John was here, I said, I, I insisted. I wanted a word from the Lord. And there was another pastor who was staying in the same house called Pastor Dan. So do you know what I did? I told Flavia, we're going to host these guys at home for dinner. You know, at first she was like, oh God, that cooking and what we, are, we have to host these people. You know why? Because I learned a secret about prophets. You want them to prophesy, first feed them. The Bible says when the prophets had eaten, they prophesied. So we fed them. They ate. When they were finished and they were beginning to say bye, I said, no, 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 no. We need to first have a session of prayer. When the prophets had eaten, they prophesied, you must prophesy before you leave here. I have witnesses, they will tell you. And we had our session of prayer there. We began, we sang some songs, we began to pray. They prophesied. But if we had let them say bye and go, they would have gone with our prophecies. They also didn't know they had them within them. But we insisted. They gave us our words of prophecy. All of us, by the way, got our words of prophecy. Hey, and some people, some people, I, I understood, some people have I understand violence. Ephraim drove all the way from his home to come to my home for that dinner and stayed around. He got his word of prophecy. Hallelujah. The violent take it by force. Begin, stop, you know, the, the, especially this Western world has taught us this thing of lining up. Everywhere you come and you find a whatever, people automatically form a queue. And they, you know, we are told to politely wait our turn. That's not how it works in the kingdom. The lady with the issue of blood didn't wait her turn at the end of the crowd. She pushed through until she got. Are you pushing through? I tell you, I insist. Every time there is an anointing, I know someone has an anointing, I insist on it. I do whatever it takes. Sometimes I'll sit, I may not have access, I'll sit in the audience and I'll say, Lord, I am not permitting that guy to leave that platform until he speaks to me. And I will use my faith to force the preacher to say something about me. Yeah. And I've seen it happen. I went to a meeting, the pastor was calling out people. He kept calling people. He calls this one, calls this one, calls this one. He was not calling me. Like, but sincerely, this is not fair. I said, Lord, this guy will not finish this meeting until he calls me. He began to conclude. I said, Lord, he cannot finish unless he has called me. I place a demand. I demand that you must meet me. That's why I love that song. It says, do not pass me by while on others thou art calling. I insisted. The man gave me a word. 
when he was about to finish, he kept saying, I don't know why I can't finish. I don't understand why I can't finish. And he finally said, young man over there, come. Once he gave me his prophecy, my prophecy, he was able to close. The kingdom of God suffereth violence. The violent take it by force. By force. Hallelujah. Stop this politeness thing. You're there, you're waiting. Oh, when he finishes that one, that one, he'll call me. If he doesn't call, you come and stand there until he, calls, until he says, oh, why? What do you want? And he'll give you what you want. Hallelujah. And you know why I look, do you know why I'm hungry for words of prophecy? Because here is the thing. Until the word is spoken, I have nothing to claim. Because he answers according to his will. When I get a word of prophecy, then I know what the will of God is. Now I can go. Now I'm like, you know these creditors who make phone calls? That's how I am when I have a word of prophecy. Now I can come back and say, Lord, you said. You said on this day by this man of God that the following is coming to me. I have come. I'm claiming my thing. I want it. And I will come back today and tomorrow and the day after. And the w Why? Because the Bible tells us. And I will start from there the next time. About persistence. Yes, next week apparently. I've just been given the next service or the next sermon. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. 